My lovely imps, for those of you who are watching live and for those of you who are catching this in the future, first off, please press the like button if, you are, uh, if you'd like to support the stream. We much love the likes. The likes help us a ton. You can wait and like, but it's better if you just like it now because I know you're going to like the video. Uh, and also subscribe, please, for the love of God. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about the concept of male socialization. Now, you might hear that and you might go, what? That seems very broad. Well, what we're referring to today is a, hmm, let's call it a, a, a regional discourse, okay? So uh, uh, trans people, there's a lot of discourse around, about, by, in between, from, for trans people on the internet. It's just how it goes. You know, people got to talk about their ideas. Some of this shit is really super toxic. Some of it isn't super toxic. And some of it becomes super toxic. And today we're going to be talking about one such topic, one such discourse that always becomes toxic. And I'm going to go through to the best of my ability and explain what people are talking about and um, and also uh, basically present my case on the topic, okay? So first off, what do people mean in trans spaces? Oh yeah, if you're cis, please keep listening. Even if you are not trans, this section will be very, very valuable to you because uh, as it turns out, discussing gender and coming to a deeper understanding of your gender is valuable for everyone, not just trans people, obviously. Um, and cis people, there's a lot of this, there's a lot of this that applies to you as well. Um, anyway, within trans spaces, the concept of male socialization generally refers to the idea that because trans women, aka, you know, people born male who transition to female throughout the course of their life, whether they use hormones or not, um, uh, that, that, pe that trans women are, uh, they experience uh, male socialization. This is the claim. Um, and when people refer to male socialization, it means that people treat you like you're a man, even if you're not. Um, and that you therefore uh, experience the experiences that are typical of men until you transition, at which point, um, you know, things obviously change and your perception has changed. Now, this is a very, very interesting topic, and it also tends to be a very sensitive topic because, well, kind of for obvious reasons, right? First off, um, you know, the implication that uh, trans women are, uh, are, are like sort of socially still men, even, even sometimes after they transition or that they were socialized as men is, it can be and is rather hurtful. The idea being that, of, that, oh, well, you know, well, you're not a real woman because you were socialized male. Um, and I have a lot of issues with this idea. And there's a whole bunch of things that I want to talk about about it. So we're going to really like, I'm going to really dig into it on this. And I'm going to say some things that might piss some people off. Okay. Um, it's an interesting, yes, as Intentions Nasty in chat says, this is an interesting topic that turns bad in the wrong hands. Now, out of this, uh, uh, out of a sense of fairness, I am going to start by, by, in, by basically steel manning the male socialization position. So please be patient with me as I attempt to steel man a position that I don't really agree with because I don't really believe in the idea of male socialization, and um, uh, and there's some reasons for that which we'll get into. But first, we're going to steel man it. So male socialization. Are there things that, uh, are there people who, um, uh, trans people even, who, who find themselves uh, with certain habits, certain behaviors, and certain experiences that differ heavily from, of course, um, cis people, but also from some other trans people? Um, and I would argue that yes, there are certain people, and there are some people, um, who do experience such a thing. Um, and this conversation, of course, comes about for um, generally, I would say, if I'm steel manning it, I want to say that the most of the people who are bringing this up in good faith are talking about things like, um, like, imagine that you didn't know you're trans until you're 35, right? And you spent, you know, your 20s, your teens, etc., 
um, essentially completely unaware that you were trans at all outside of maybe your own internal things. And, uh, and you know, maybe you participated in a bunch of like masculine typical behaviors. Maybe um, you were even successful, quote unquote, at, uh, at sort of um, filling the role of a masculine role. You know, maybe you were, you know, typically, uh, maybe maybe you were in a typically masculine field. Maybe you were in a, uh, maybe you had, um, you know, some benefits as a result of that. That is the, that is what most people are talking about. They're mostly trying to dig in and analyze, well, is it possible that somebody who transitions at like a later point in their life, that there was a period in which they didn't know, in which to, to basically everyone else, they were functionally just another guy, at least from the exterior. And that's where, that's where like the good faith version of this comes from. The idea that, okay, well, we should think about this, right? Like, what if you, you know, we all know that like, uh, uh, that like, um, dudes are, are, are taught in, in our society, a lot of things, um, that there is a, a real thing called patriarchy, uh, that patriarchy isn't really about men, like literally ruling the world, although that is actually kind of true how it pans out that that men end up in positions of power, but that patriarchy discusses a way of looking at the world that puts the needs, the concerns, the interests of predominantly men first. Um, um, uh, yeah, like, like, like Nuts says, Nuts brings up an example, trans feminine people being tops uh, comes from when they were boy moding and fucked cis women. Some people would believe that. And there might be even some truth in that. There might be something valuable to be gleaned from that saying, huh, um, maybe there are some things that uh, I experienced when I was younger that uh, affected me in this certain way. Maybe there are some habits that would be best unlearned, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and like I said, in, in the best version of this discourse, um, comes from an honest place of trying to basically grapple with the incredibly complex experience of being gendered at all. And when I say the term being gendered, I say that very deliberately because our society gives us and impresses upon us gender uh, at every single aspect in ways that even trans people, even some trans people lose track of. I mean, the most obvious example, one that everybody will recognize instantly, is every single time you walk into Target or Walmart or any store, basically, that there is a women's section with a bunch of clothes that are usually, you know, m tend to be more bright colors, tend to be more flowy, tend to be way more varied, and also, uh, like, have flowers, all kinds of things like that. And then there's a men's section, which has lots of, like, clean-cut, uh, you know, uh, you know, sort of like boxier clothes, uh, things that are less about, uh, less immediately about style, more like, oh, this is like a tough, you know, you got a tough like cargo pants, or you got, uh, you got your 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 suits, or you got your uh, your like windbreakers, things like that. Now, of course, we can all acknowledge that, like, this is not like all encompassing. Obviously, there's all kinds of variants but that's the point what i'm saying is that every store you walk into at the very least there is that line there is a stark noticeable line you can even notice it without seeing the signs because if you wander from one section into the other everything changes the way that it's being sold to you the the advertisements used the people pictured everything um oh yeah darker colors less like uh, varied colors this is what we call a like an it is it is impressed upon you it is in, it is uh, induced and and oppressive it's 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 literally forced on you whether you fit into that binary or not you're made to because you have to buy clothes at a store no matter whether or not you even like imagine this for just a second imagine you're an alien just for one second from another planet just pretend you're an alien and you arrive here and you're human in shape the aliens look look and act just like humans in basically every way, except on your planet, every human can wear whatever clothes they want. If you arrive on this planet and you go, well, I'm, I'm here, I'm gonna go into this store and, and buy some human clothes, and you go in and all of a sudden, you have to choose which side of the store you're gonna walk on. Even though in your culture, that doesn't exist, you can choose whatever clothes you want, that 
binary is being impressed upon you and you have to engage with it because that's what the dominant society chooses. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense to everyone. Um, like I said, we're just doing a little thought experiment for a second. I'm giving you an example of how gender can be impressed upon us in a lot of ways, how a gender binary can be impressed upon us, and that it can, that, that, that diving into this can be a very valuable thing. So this, this ties back to, let's tie this back to the male socialization. The idea being that in our highly gendered, highly, uh, like forcibly enforced gender society, that when you appear externally to be uh, male or to be female, that, um, that, that there are certain expectations that are likely to be placed on you. There are certain things that are likely to be taught to you. There are certain social experiences that you're likely to engage with. So there's the, there's the steel manned version of the idea of and the argument of male socialization. That essentially, if you are um, pr pr you know, sufficiently externally gendered masculine or gendered male very frequently, um, that you may, because of that experience, pick up, uh, you may experience certain things, you may uh, have certain outlooks taught to you and told to you, and you may um, be, be sort of channeled in a certain way, okay? But this is where the Steel Man segment ends, because um, I just wanted to make sure that I gave it a fair shake, because there's a lot of problems with this idea. And the reason why I even care to talk about it at all um, on this particular uh, subject is because I think that this topic is most frequently used in bad faith. That I don't think that most people are using this as like a, as a jumping off point to discuss about how we're all influenced by gender. Um, which I do think that there's some value there, right? Like, um, like I think there's some value from that. I've, I've certainly gained uh, lots of personal uh, 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 ideas from thinking about my own past. My past, I'm trans for those who don't know, I'm trans feminine, it's kind of obvious, but yeah. Um, but, but you know, I grew up in an incredibly gendered environment and it has been very valuable for me to look back on that and go, hey, what are these things? How did I engage with them? What were my experiences? And like I said, though, most of the time, this concept of male socialization, um, this, uh, <laughs> this male socialization concept is not used like this at all. It's not used as a potential framework to analyze the history of your gender uh, to make you think deeper. It's not used like an academic tool. It's not used as a, as a single frame of analysis. Instead, it begins to take this very strange shape where, to be frank, there are, there are large groups of people that use the idea of male socialization to essentially be like, well, you know, you have to work off having been a, a man or having been uh, been gendered as a man for your, for, you know, until you're going to be accepted as a woman. And that's pretty fucked up. Not only is it, is it like hurtful, but also it's just wrong. Um, it, it's also like super, super essentialist. And so there's like a number of issues that are wrong with this concept that I think make it essentially um, a problematic framework uh, when taken beyond a very, very simple, like, question, you know? Um, and there's, there's two angles that I kind of want to talk about to begin with. The first angle being, uh, does male socialization exist for cis people? And the second angle being, does male socialization exist for trans people? And um, it gets really complicated really fast, really, really fast. And this is part of the reason why I don't think this framework is super useful for general conversation, why I, don't, why I think it tends to be misused very, very frequently. Um, so for cis people, um, is there such a thing as male socialization? Um, and I think, that, I think you could argue that at least to some degree, there is some concept of male socialization, especially in certain bubbles. But keep in mind, that there are limits to this. Um, 
For example, let me give you an example of this. Ready? Uh, a lot of you might be able to acknowledge that in America, a lot of guys, a lot of cis guys, have pretty problematic um, relationships to uh, certain uh, certain concepts. Like, for example, consent. There is, uh, we, we know from pure statistics that our culture has an issue with teaching, um, you know, uh, uh, masculine people in our society like good, good practices about consent, and part of that is, uh, is, <laughs> uh, part of that is, um, is, is simply because uh, we live in a we live in a society that was heavily influenced by Christianity. Christianity is a highly patriarchal religion. It puts the needs and desires of men before basically anything, and also has a God that is. Um, while not technically in the text, a man is certainly masculine, and many, many Christians do believe that God is functionally a man. Um, and, uh, and, and um, so we can acknowledge that to a certain degree, there is some level of, uh, of a social experience that is shared between many, many men. And um, I think that, of course, if, if I was to poll the cis men in my audience and ask whether they had been bullied, for example, for crying when they were younger, um, if that was, if that was, you know, if that was something that I, I bet that most cis men would be able to say yes. Almost all of them in the audience would be able to say yes. Um, so obviously, some level of male socialization does exist. Most men in American society are going to experience bullying for crying, for showing emotions, for things like that, for liking the wrong things. Um, and, uh, but, but, but that's a very, but saying that that is a, that is male socialization becomes problematic because what if you grew up in a slightly different culture? There's lots of different cultures in America. There is no one monoculture, not even a little, not even close. There are tons of different interpretations on masculinity, even within America. There are variations based on the city that you grow up in. There are variations based on the cultural background that your family has. There are variations based on the religion you grew up as or whether you grew up religious at all. There are huge variances even in that experience. So while it, there is certain things that you can point to, and I will admit, I have pointed to these sorts of things. I've talked about these things in our society um, all the time, stuff that dudes tend to experience and tend to be told is okay. Um, I, I hesitate to call that male socialization because it's not really um, just about sex. It's about, it's a lot about role and it's incredibly, incredibly punitive and this is where we tie into part two, to people who do not change their behavior. So um, this is where the, the male socialization um, question becomes very, very complicated. Because for most cis men, um, obviously, being that they're cis men, they will not or they don't have as much reason to challenge the uh, uh, the, 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 the gender roles that they're taught because they're relatively comfortable in them. That's kind of what makes you a cis guy is that you don't really have like a sense of necessarily a sense of gender dysphoria about your gender. Not that it doesn't exist because I do believe it does. Um, even in cis people who aren't trans, who don't need to transition or don't want to transition, but they nonetheless have certain things. Um, and, uh, or they have certain, you know, things that, that chafe with, with, with the gender roles as they exist. Um, yeah, lots of people do though. See, as Nuts says, I challenge them anyway. Lots of people do. Lots and lots of people do. Um, and usually, they're very, very punished for this. Now, that changes the question pretty significantly. Because keep in mind that like for trans people, um, okay, so, sorry, let me take a step back. For cis men, is there an idea, is there a concept is, is the, the idea of male socialization real? Obviously, it depends on what you mean, but to a certain degree, there is some truth that's there. How far we can take that is very questionable. Um, and I think it's, it can be valuable to talk about insofar as it's analyzing the common experiences across many, many groups of men, but it has to be kept within, it has to be kept within its bounds 
Like I said, because there's lots of men who A, challenge it without being trans necessarily, without identifying as being trans, and also who just come from different cultural backgrounds. Another great example. Think about the difference between male affection in like Greek families versus male affection in American families. And, and if you happen to grow up as an American in a Greek family, in a family that immigrated from Greece, you're going to have a very, very different perspective on intermale uh, uh, affection that's very different from most Americans. So this idea of male socialization, even for cis people, really starts to fall apart in a lot of ways. The idea that there is a universal male experience that can be applied to all people who have XY chromosomes, it starts to fall apart really, really quick. It just does. So, so then, then, <laughs> then we have to move to the, the, uh, the question of, is it real for trans people? Let me just tell you this, okay? Uh, as I just explained, and as I just pointed out by, uh, I did a little tricky, you see? Because I asked the cis men in audience, the self-identified cis men in the audience, if there were certain things that they experienced, like for example, being bullied for crying. And basically everyone said yes. Now imagine that, but, but, but just, just even multiplied by double or triple. And I'm telling you, trans people tend to have a lot more gender nonconformity, by definition, uh, than cis people do. So the idea of male socialization, this idea that there is sort of universal factors of male experience that both cis and trans people would experience really starts to fall apart when you start talking about trans people. Because for all of those times that cis guys get bullied for a X thing that isn't standard, there is a number of things that are perfectly standard that you just happen by a roll of the dice to be okay with and you never face any friction on that front. Um, because it's just something that comes naturally to you. For example, you know, if you tend to be a super masculine guy, you know, beard and, and strong and like to do hard work, even if you have, uh, even if you don't agree with patriarchy or even if you're very gender, you know, you're, you're very digging into gender and digging into it and trying to think about it, chances are just by, by pure chance of you liking those things and falling into that role well, you're going to have less friction. But trans people, specifically people who identify as trans femmes, do not have that same experience. Everything about who they are, especially if they're feminine enough that they would pursue transition, um, or at least they feel feminine enough and attached to femininity enough that they would pursue transition, they're going to come up to an innumerable amount of, of walls and punishments, social punishments. And that was the... I can speak from my own experience, for example. Um, I've spoken about this multiple times on my stream. I was made fun of for being a faggot. I was made fun of for being gay my entire life, even though I was didn't know I was trans until I was about 20. And also, I wasn't, I wasn't interested in men at that time in my life. Not even a little. When I was younger, I wasn't really interested in anybody. I was a pretty... Uh, I was a pretty quiet kid um, when I was younger. Um, and so despite that though, I was made fun of relentlessly for being effeminate in ways I didn't even understand at the time. I literally didn't even get it at the time. Uh, I just didn't get why people treated me so bad for the things that I did. Uh, and, uh, and so I was never really, I was never accepted among men by and large. I was never accepted in male circles. And it's not because there weren't like masculine interests I had. There's a lot that I had. I mean, I'm a pretty he heavy gamer. I went into film, which is a, a heavily mas uh, mask men, man dominated field. Um, I was interested in science early on. Um, I, you know, all these things, but nonetheless, there was I can't even count the number of things. My, my, my family would get mad at me for things like the way that I held my hands, which apparently was like too princessy or something. And I would get mocked relentlessly for these things. 
things I couldn't even perceive of. So it's the inverse. While cis, well, while cis guys who are comfortable or relatively comfortable in their role of masculinity have all these things that just never have friction because of essentially chance, trans women it have the opposite, which is that not only are you po pro probably experiencing your own gender dysphoria on an internal level, AKA like, I am not comfortable with the things that I'm told I need to do, but also on an external level, you are being punished perpetually for things you don't even know why. You don't even get it. So essentially, the question of is male socialization real for trans people, the answer, of course, is also no. The male socialization isn't a, uni isn't a universal experience for cis men, and it's certainly not for trans women who, uh, you know, may spend some portion of their life being externally identified as men. Because keep in mind that in our society, every deviance from the gender norm, from what is seen as, which is, of course, it's impossible to know. You, you literally, it's so hard to know all of the things that are gendered in our society. It is unbelievable. Colors are gendered. You know, can you imagine? Guys, just think about it. Think back to when you were in elementary school. If you had, if you were a, a dude, okay? Or maybe you knew a dude. If you're a, if you're a woman, maybe you knew a dude who had like a purple thing like this, like a little purple thing. If you had this on your backpack, how many of you would say it would, if you're being honest, would you get bullied for it? Just for having a purple animal on your backpack. I know for a fact that every, even the public schools I went to, if you had something pink or purple on you at all, you would be relentlessly bullied. Yeah, literally purple, that's gay. Yep, I, I, like I expected, chat is of course, uh, is of course willing to confirm that that was you know, largely their experience as well. And this is, of course, this is little, just a little anecdote to, to spice things up a little bit. But I think that's a pretty, uh, a pretty universal uh, experience is that, is, that, uh, uh, is that any gender variance in our society, not just male, not just female, any gender variance is policed very heavily. How many cis women out there, how many of you got called a tomboy at some point or another in your life for, for something that made no sense to you? I would be willing to bet every single cis, cis, cis woman in this audience was called a tomboy uh, uh, at some point in their life because they did something that didn't make any sense to, to, to them why they were being punished for it. Yes, we'll talk about that as well, Elac Cabal. Yes, that's true. Intentions Nasty brings up for the longest time, even just hair color was essentially uh, taboo to be worn by cis men. Yeah, pastels. Yeah, uh, so lots of people had experiences with this. So male socialization is, it, it, it falls apart really fast, as I have kind of demonstrated here, this idea of male socialization. And it's interesting because patriarchy as a concept is not exactly the same thing as male socialization. Patriarchy essentially argues that our society has certain values that are deeply ingrained, that are reinforced and punished persistently, but that isn't really the same thing. That really isn't the same claim uh, as what is being claimed with the idea of male socialization, um, especially because we know that the variance is so unbelievably ridiculous between person to person from household to household. While there are certain things, I'm sure, that are uh, very, very, very common and, uh, and can of course be valuable for, our, for like any sort of societal analysis, we should be really careful about making this the argument that this is something essential. So there's the essentialism. That's the next thing that I really, really wanted to talk about which is the essentializ essentialization portion of male so uh, socialization, uh, of the idea of male socialization, and how that sort of varies from the idea of patriarchy, where patriarchy describes systems that reward, uh, that essentially reward and uh, control uh, gender expression, that reward certain types of gender expression, which is very different than making the argument that there is a, there is a, there is a, a 
socialization that all males experience at some point in their life when we know that's not simp that simply is not true. Male socialization is definitely informed by patriarchy. Well, of course it is. I would argue that a lot of these sort of these near universals that we've pointed out um, are the product of systems that are designed to essentially filter out everyone who doesn't fit a certain, uh, a certain, um, like a certain type. But that doesn't necessarily mean that people are being socialized male, that they're being successfully converted that way. All that patriarchy says is that people who are a certain way will be rewarded if they can stay that way and never break that character. And that's very different than making the argument that every single male experiences certain socializing aspects. They're very different. It, it, it's, it can be, it can, it's a little confusing. It's a little bit of in the weeds, but they are different things. Um, and, and, uh, and, and, and the essentialization is a big problem, okay? Okay, so, um, so, so let's, let's, let's talk about that essentialization. Um, when we talk of what is, what is essentializing, uh, essentialization? For those who don't know what the term essentialization means, the idea of essentialization is that there is something that is, uh, a, a, something that is essential to gender, that to whatever gender you are or whatever sex you are, usually people who are gender essentialists are also sex essentialists, AKA if you're born with XY chromosomes, you are a male and that's that, okay? These things have large overlaps, right? Hey, Merrick, good to see you, great to see you. Um, um, and, and so there's all kinds of forms of essentialization that exist in the world. Uh, obviously there's racial essentialization, the idea that all black people or all white people behave a certain way or all, you know, uh, uh, ethnicities behave a certain way, uh, whatever. There's a whole bunch of different, uh, as types of essentialization. And there is also gender essentialization and sex essentialization, which in my experience, those two things tend to be basically the same. Um, I don't think that most people uh, believe, like who believe that there are essential traits to gender, uh, make a distinction between gender and sex. Um, and essentializ essentialization is, is really, really problematic. And it's problematic because it makes very large assumptions about the way that people will behave and also informs politics uh, about the way people uh, 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 you know, assumes or, or sorry, informs politics to sh take shape based around these very broad universal assumptions about everybody who shares that certain essential trait. And to me, that is like the antithesis of, of, of any f form of, of real and meaningful gender analysis. Um, gender is a a mess. It is a nebulous, messy, highly social, uh, highly variant. It changes based on your generation. It changes on your region. It changes based on your religion. Uh, it changes so much. It's a giant mess. And so, uh, and, and, and it doesn't, as we all know, it doesn't tie directly to sex. While there are certain overlaps, for example, cis men, uh, you know, cis men, are you know are are how tend to be at least as far as we know tend to have xy chromosomes um and there tends to be more people with xy chromosomes who are comfortable being uh being masculine uh than there are like trans people that's just that's that's just chance you know what i mean that's just that's not necessarily it doesn't mean, mean that there's necessarily something intrinsic to having xy genetics that makes you that way uh, what I'm trying to elucidate here a little bit clumsily, and I apologize for that. What I'm trying to elucidate here is, uh, is the difference between sex and gender. Sex has to do with your chromosomes. It has to do with the type of, of hormones your body produces. Gender is the role that you are seen as, that you, uh, experience, that you, uh, that you, ex the way you express yourself in society and how, uh, you engage with that. And I think that essentialization undercuts any meaningful analysis of gender because gender isn't essential. Gender is something that changes and fluctuates all the time. And it 
and let me just be honest, first of all, the technology has has not existed until very recently to even tell uh, to even tell what chromosomes people have. But even now that we have the technology, the vast majority of people don't actually know what their chromosomes are. You don't actually know what your sex is. We engage with gender. Everything that we engage with is gender, with very, very few exceptions. Very few, okay? Extremely few exceptions. Maybe if you are, uh, if you have needs of a special medication that uh, engages with certain um, parts of your genetic, your doctor might need to know what chromosomes you have. But by and large, we don't ever engage with sex. We engage with gender. We engage with the, we socialize with the social aspects. And essentialization of something that fluctuates as much as social perception of gender is really stupid. It's patently wrong. Think about this, for example, an example of this, an example of why it's so stupid to have an essentialist view of gender. Um, in Victorian times, uh, high heels, and in fact, in pre-Victorian times, for, for probably longer than not, high heels were considered a sign of masculinity because they made you taller, they made you stand taller, they, they were painful to wear, uh, they required a stealing will, they were expensive, which means you had to be powerful in order to afford them. So high heels, which are now exclusively worn by well, not exclusively, but essentially, by from the in the view of our society, are as are are as, are are like as feminine as you can get in our society. It, it's it's very it's very weird. It's very uncommon to see a masculine person wearing high heels. Quite rare, um, but that wouldn't have been the case 150 years ago. In fact, it would have been completely different. And yet, tons of people will argue with that is a gender expression, fashion is a form of gender expression. It's highly gendered in our society. There are people who will argue that gender is essential, that there is something intrinsic to being male or intrinsic to being feminine or, or, or uh, intrinsic to being female that somehow influences wh whether men or women in our society tend to wear high heels. But obviously we can acknowledge that's patented, patently ridiculous on its face. Are you following? We know that things change. We know that these things aren't bound up in our genetics. There is nothing about our genetics that, uh, that makes us gravitate towards high heels or that makes us gravitate towards makeup. And it's interesting because these days, a lot of the like Jordan Peterson types will try to tell you that there's something essential about makeup, that makeup is like, um, that like makeup is a thing that women do because they want to attract suitable mates. But that's really interesting as well because throughout history, as it turns out, there have been cultures and time periods, even within this culture, where men wearing makeup was common. Where uh, it is only in, in very recent history that men wearing makeup has become something taboo. That these conceptualizations of gender arose. They don't have anything to do with genetics. Nothing. Nothing at all. And we can see that by the way that, yeah, yeah, people talk about, oh, it's to make you red or whatever. That's bullshit. That might be true. Maybe some women right now are motivated to wear makeup because they want to attract a more suitable mate. That's not genetic. That's social. Because I, I guarantee you, if you went back in time and jumped cultures over to, I don't know, uh, uh, let's think, um, I believe it was in the Middle East, in a lot of Middle Eastern cu cultures, that men were the ones who would wear jewelry and makeup. That I bet that a woman in that, uh, a woman who decided to wear makeup in that society wouldn't be doing it for the same reason that a woman in our society is making up, is, is wearing makeup. It can't be genetic then. It has to be social. Intentions Nasty brings up something interesting here. Before I started T, I was really afraid that I would lose my emotionality, but it turns out that part of behavior and mental state is learned. It's not just, it's not just learned, it's experiential. Um, yes, are there some emotional effects that tend to happen when you, when you take new hormones? Absolutely true for me. For example, I found it much easier to cry after taking estradiol, after getting on estrogen, because for me, Testosterone really made me feel bottled up. 
it made it made me feel different but that is not a universal experience by any means and even if there are some biological effects some mood effects that hormones can have that doesn't mean that they're essential that just means that they're tendencies that just means there are certain interactions doesn't necessarily mean that they're essential but yes as as xerox 13 star says it's not just learned they're learned and enforced which is another uh, another portion of this whole male socialization thing that really, really gets me, frust gets me frustrated, okay? Because the enforcement part is really fucking, really, really fucking important. For example, let me give you, let me give you a quick example. Let's say a cis man uh, experiences, uh, basically cries at a young age and is bullied for it. And they say, okay, well, I'm not supposed to cry. My dad got mad at me when I cried. So I'm gonna try and, you know, control that a little easier. Well, you know, maybe you could do that. Maybe you could do that fine. Maybe it's easier for you. Maybe you are like, oh, actually, you know what? I actually like being strong and silent. Maybe that feels good to me. Maybe I'm gonna do that going forward. Uh, a, a trans woman might not be able to slot into that at all. So the enforcement might work relatively fine. And it might work out that that enforcement, while it may have hurt in the moment, didn't become a recurring and chronic issue for a cis person. Now, it could. I'm just saying it could. I'm just giving an example here. Whereas, let's say a trans woman is bullied for crying at a young age for being too sensitive, but then can't, cannot slot into that strong and silent role because that's not who she is. Because that would be a betrayal of who she is. She just doesn't feel that way. That's not how her emotions go. That's a very different experience, isn't it? And I'm not obviously not saying all cis men, but I'm not making the argument for male socialization. I'm against the position. If it's not apparent, I am against the idea of male socialization for exactly this reason. What I'm pointing out, though, is that uh, that enforcement, that chronic enforcement is a huge part of this discussion. And this is where we get to the part about where it gets even more complicated, because I don't think that I don't think that trans people uh, exper truly experience, uh, like specifically trans women, I'm talking from a trans feminine perspective, I'm talking from a position of a trans woman. Um, I don't think that trans women experience male socialization because I don't think that it can ever really stick. That's why you're trans. It doesn't, it, these things don't fucking stick. You can't be forced to be someone that you're not. That, that, that those, those societal enforcement uh, uh, th those societal enforcement measures that punish you for, for stepping out of line, um, you never can fit into there. And if you can, it comes at an incredible personal cost. So there's always a chafing, even when you're in the closet, even if people see you as, as when they first meet you, they identify you as male. It shows through. The fact that you're not fitting in shows through. Now, of course, I also being the based and gigantic brained gender ascensionist that we should ascend beyond the concept of gender we should move beyond using gender as a meaningful that gender is essentially a meaningless construct that does very little beneficial for us being that type i can acknowledge that lots of cis men actually live lives of quiet misery because they are they are also suffering from the same thing even if they never want to transition, even if they never see themselves as women or never want to, many cis men suffer from the enforcement measures that are placed upon their gender for their entire life. This is part of the reason why I don't believe in male socialization. Now, this is where it's going to get a little, uh, it, now it's going to be a little, a little, it's going to get a little more spicy, okay? Because here's what I really think most of the conversation is about, okay? I'm going to show you guys a little meme, okay? There's a meme I saved. And, and you know what? I know memes. Memes? Not an argument. Actually, this time, it is an argument. Okay? Here you go. Right here. This image right here. The silencer on the, on the gun. Socialized male, evil tranny freak. This right here, this meme, is exactly why I get so mad at the concept of male socialization. Because in my experience, that is almost always how male socialization is used. Okay? Um, like, 
essentially what a lot of people, usually people who are transphobes, usually people who have some bone to pick with trans people, or they have an underlying bigotry like trans women aren't real women or whatever, like those things, a lot of times you will see them because they don't want to they don't want to offend everyone. So instead, what they'll basically say is, well, you know, this trans person who did something problematic was socialized male. You want to know an example of this? You want to know an ex example of how this has been weaponized against me? You all know I can be pretty goddamn aggro, right? You guys know that. I'm a I'm a bit of a debater. I like to argue with people. I like to ah, ah, you know some people have unironically many times actually um some before i streamed some after i streamed argued that it was male type typical behavior in fact i still sometimes once in a great while get comments about this oh well you know it really it's really interesting that demon mama is so aggressive i guess it must be the fact that uh that uh he is a tranny you know that sort of thing um so it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting how that works. It's really interesting how if you show any supposedly masculine trait after transition, all of a sudden you're being policed really hard in the other direction. And all of a sudden it's male socialization. It's not, hey, you're doing something I think is problematic. Let me challenge it on its own merits. It's no, 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 no. It must be because you're a trans. That's why. It's because you were born male. That's why you're, that's why you're this way. There's so many examples of this. You want to know another example that's really fucked up? Um, tran uh, so, so people will will see trans people flirting with one another online. They'll see trans women um, being flirty. And here's another, here's the real kicker. They'll see tops, uh, trans tops and trans doms as essentially men. They will be, be, it'll be like, oh, the reason why you're not submissive like a real woman. They don't say that. They won't say those words because that would be fucked up, wouldn't it? They'll say instead, oh, yeah, yeah, this person is a top because, well, you know, they were born male. So that's why they're dominant. That's why they're a top. That's why they're... And this is the other one that happens. That's why they're flirting on the internet. That's why they're, uh, this is used a lot against um, trans sex workers. You know, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She was socialized male. That's why she's a sex worker. That's why she likes posting herself naked and being so sexual. And it's interesting because if you if you sit there, they're, they're basically putting a woke pa paint of coat on, on fucking misogyny, on, on fucking sexism. It's so fucked up. And this this is all over the place, by the way. The reason why I, I had my preamble be so fair is because I really wanted to make a lock solid case. But in truth, I get really fucking pissed about this because this is the way that I see it used the most. The fucking most. I see a, a aggression, quote unquote, aggression, is is policed in trans women trans women are are are, are said are, are basically written off as being t masculine and and having t you know t brain or testosterone brain anytime they stand up for themselves any expression of transsexuality of 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 a trans woman being sexual is seen as a male trait there's even a joke this is a joke used by like 4chan self-hating trans people called where they say male brained that's very male brained of you like for example a trans woman talking about masturbation will often say wow very male brained of you because apparently only men masturbate apparently only xy people masturbate it's so stupid. And so really, really quickly, you, you go from this, like I said, this very fair idea that I, this, like, that I steel manned in the beginning, you never have that conversation. Instead, it's this goddamn image every single fucking time. Every single fucking time. And trans women get fucking nailed for this constantly. Every single, like, uh, guys, like I wish I could express to you. I know that I know the trans women in my audience are going to be hearing this and just just I, 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 I listen, I fucking I, I fucking feel you on this. Okay, and I know you're going to feel me when I say this trans women are constantly it doesn't even matter your social circle unless your social circle is like really small uh, and and doesn't involve any conservative people 
are constantly being watched for every male sign possible to basically prove, yeah, I knew it. You actually were just a man all along. You weren't a real woman. And this does happen to cis women as well. I've mentioned this before, but to a significantly less degree. And what I mean by that is, um, I've talked about this before about how like older women, how older women, fat women, and, uh, and butch women basically get treated as though they're not actually women. They just get treated, they get made fun of and treated as though they're men or as though they're failed women. And this comes from the same place, but it's significantly less present against cis women because, well, because frankly, in our society, cis women are more acceptable than trans women. Oh, black women, of course, obviously. Sorry, I, I obviously. Thank you, nuts. Yes, uh, black, black women get so policed for their masculinity, it's unbelievable. And of course, that makes sense because, you know, black women of color are specifically targeted for this all the time. I agree, socialist potato. Um, but, but the... There's this this essentialization and the underlying problems of assuming that there is a single type of socialization that all males experience really undermines the value of the framework of male socialization, like severely to the degree where it basically just becomes a uh, it becomes a transphobic dog whistle. And most of the time when I see socialized male, I assume with good reason that it is a it is a a a transphobic dog whistle oh yeah there's a great example take for an example of this as xerox 13 star in in uh, um as xerox in, in in chat brings up oh my god i heard so much about michelle obama growing up in the south about how she was really a man yeah look at the way that republicans talked about michelle obama for a perfect example of this that that same shit that they do to Michelle Obama, who, you know, where Michelle Obama is in a position of incredible power, but that same shit is is dumped out on black on on black cis women, on black trans women to an unbelievable degree, on trans women in general. Transvestigations. That's a whole thing that people do, where it's like, oh, I can tell, we can tell. No, they can't. First of all, they can never tell, and secondly. Uh, the things that they think that they can tell are, are, it's, it's phrenology. It's fucking phrenology. And, and, uh, and so I, I find this whole conversation to be incredibly infuriating. And it makes me especially mad when I see trans people participate in it. And I know that a lot of trans people are really, are, are engaging in as good faith as possible. But there are trans people who buy into these models who essentially buy into the idea that they're not supposed to be sexual, they're not supposed to have a aggressive bone in their body ever, they're never supposed to show anger, they're never supposed to get dirty, they basically need to become a, a stereotype of a hype of hyper feminine. And you want to know what's the sickest thing of all? Is that the trans women who do that get targeted even still. Because one of the main things that transphobes love to say about trans women is that trans women, oh, why do they have to make it like a parody of femininity? There's, they, they go so over the top, it's because they're, it must be because they're insecure in their femininity. No, it's because if you don't go full femme at all times, you're called a male. And then when you do go full femme, you're, you're told that you're compensating for something. It's disgusting. It's genuinely fucking disgusting. Yes, it's measure head, but for gender. So this is why I, this is part of the reason why I think a big part of the reason why I think socialized male needs to be retired as like a talking point. It does not provide us any analytical value. Um, like if, like if you want to talk about like, like a trans woman who, okay, let's imagine, let's steel man this. Let's imagine there's a trans woman, okay? We're inventing a trans woman, okay? Let's imagine that there's a trans woman who really, who flirts really, uh, like really pressures, uh, women, like flirts really hard with women, other women, and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and you know, has like a bunch of red pill behaviors. You would, pr you should, Let's say that that person exists. I'm sure there's probably some trans woman like that out there in the world. 
Why does that have to do with male socialization? There are lesbians who do that. There are cis lesbians who do that. There are, there are, there are, I know this is going to come as a shock. There are cis het women that push lines and cross boundaries. <gasps> oh my God. Do you see how quickly we start to get into really problematic territory? Where we start to get into replicating patriarchy again with models that argue for essentialist views of the world? We are inventing, we are literally inventing a trans woman to get mad at right now. Something that's really funny, a lot of gender essentialists uh, will essentially make the argument that, that, women, that, there are, that women rapists don't exist, which is absurd. We know that's patently false and it spits in the face of victims. And also it makes, you, it makes your worldview so bankrupt. But there are le legitimately, there are the, the gender critical movement, the TERFs, those people, they say shit like this all the time. They essentially do not believe that it's possible. And some of them literally don't believe it's possible for a woman to commit the act of rape, which is fucking disgusting. The idea that you could basically just be like, no, that person didn't do anything wrong. Women never cross boundaries. That is a level of, of brain rot that I cannot, I cannot even stand. And yet it exists. And yet I see this shit. And in fact, I mean, obviously, as you guys all know, this, uh, this, this topic exists for a reason. I called it a discourse alert because unfortunately, socialized male became a discourse in leftist spaces over the last couple of days after a don't really know much about them, don't really care all that much, after a leftist made a tweet talking about how lots of white trans women, which is another interesting little euphemism that they do, how lots of white trans women need to deal with the fact and do the work because they were socialized male, which is one of the most god-awful, stupid, moronic uh, arguments that I can possibly imagine. That like trans women in general need to do the work to undo the horrific trauma they experienced their entire lives. What are you fucking talking about? Do you see how this is like, it's like, it's like, it's, it's, it's bigotry with a, with a coat, with a woke coat of paint. It's bigotry with a rainbow flag painted onto it. Unbelievable. It, it, it fucking disgusts me. And this is all, this was all over the place in leftist spaces with people basically being like, yeah, as if trans women, uh, uh, as if trans women were like somehow like magically immune to the horrible mistreatment. By the way, just so you know, I don't have to lean on anecdotes. You want to go, you want to go, don't, don't go look at any research about how much discrimination and mistreatment trans people experience before they come out of the closet because you'll be shocked. I can tell from my, I can tell you from my own experience of my entire fucking childhood my entire i mean my entire life but specifically i'm referring to my childhood when i when i was i still identified by others as a boy i was mistreated i was bullied for being effeminate for being not masculine so hard you would not even believe it was endless it was perpetual It's such a bad idea. So, stop. Stop. Is it important for us to question how our social lives implement, you know, affected us? How our, so, how, how our perception um, may have influenced how we were treated in some situations and, how, and certain things that we were taught? Absolutely. But when you start doing woke gender essentialism, you're really not helping anybody. Retire it. Socialized male is not a fucking useful framework. It, do, it, it, it is built off of false premises and the end conclusions are only essentialist. You understand? It doesn't help you come to a more holistic understanding of gender. It takes you further from the truth, not closer.